Hello everyone, this is Professor Lusheen. Uh, this is lecture seven. I'd like to continue with what we started on lecture six. So this is gonna be the post-accident investigation uh, and I'd like you to read textbook chapters uh, 10 through 12. Again, many of these can be used pre or post, but I decided to put them in here. Here is the table and the content from the textbook from chapter seven through 12. As I had mentioned in a previous lecture, these are getting more simpler up to more sophisticated. So the tree, the, the fault tree and analytical tree is very much a graphic representation of all the different components of a process or a set of tasks that, and how they connect. And it also has in uh, decision points, it, many times decision points. Uh, and you can see the tree symbols and how it is. This is very much for engineers. Uh, so they can kind of plot it all out. Uh, personally, for myself, I haven't found a tree analysis to be very helpful uh, unless I was doing like a process safety analysis to find out, you know, how things flow through pipes and, and what sort of reactor reactors or unit operations they flow into and flow out of and things like that. Uh, but for everyday safety things, uh, it's not as, as applicable. The cause and effect analysis is interesting because this encompasses some very popular uh, techniques and I'll, I'll, I'll call attention to the third one on the list here on the screen which is the 5Y. The 5Y was the same technique used in the video you watched uh, by the Geron Institute. Uh, I had referred to it in a previous lecture that it, it's trying to get to the root cause. The Apollo method and the fishbone diagram, or the fishbone analysis, that we always call it fishbone diagram, are all great techniques. And what they do is they just try to logically piece together and try to get away from blaming the worker. Because that's really the point of an accident investigation is not to blame the worker. They didn't do it on purpose, but to understand what what placed them into a condition that either they made a choice or exhibited a behavior that allowed them to be exposed. That's what we need to uncover because we don't want it to happen again. We want to prevent it from happening again. And I really like these uh, techniques, if you will. They're very good and they can actually be used supplementally to some of the other techniques. So if I had to identify any particular chapter that I would say is most critical to the practice of safety, it would be the cause and effect analysis chapter. The uh, chapter 12, it was basically outdated as soon as the book was published because every, every several months, it seems like I get a, a new email or see a new advertisement for the, the latest safety app or audit app or investigation app. There are so many of them there and there are so many more companies popping up all over the place that have a new uh, dashboard or system or cloud-based uh, to collect information. Uh, these are, these tend to be um, the more sophisticated, the more integrated they are into the overall um, technology used by a company, the more expensive they are. Uh, I mean, you could very simply create your own form. It'd be there'd be more manual work to it if you could use like a, a Microsoft Word, either either their database or a Microsoft Excel. But these are all very good systems, but they are expensive. If you if you ever work for a company who's interested in purchasing and utilizing a computer-based technology or some sort of other specialized approach. Um, I would recommend you go to a conference that has an exposition hall and then go and talk to the different groups and maybe because what you'd really want to do is find one that would allow you to pilot test it. So you make sure it does fit the needs of your company, but also properly integrate with the other uh, technologies. So now let's actually get into the, the post-accident investigation or what we typically call accident investigation. This class I'm calling pre and post. Uh, and so what it really is, we're trying to get past the, uh, the initial or what will be conceived of as the uh, attribution error of uh, what caused the accident. And that is to look beyond the worker um, and to build upon whatever uh, investigation technique or, or, or paperwork the company has. Because they, the original or the prototypical approaches to tax investigation tend to lead to blaming the worker and it just if, if if a worker behaves or makes a decision due to the conditions in their work environment 
And then what you do is you pluck them out of there and punish them, retrain them. But let's say another person gets into that same situation. Would they make the same decision or would they behave the same way? That's the question that you should be asking. If the answer is yes, then why you can't blame the individual. If But if you can, if the individual, this was a very unique and deliberate uh, violation of what they should have been the training, well, got to figure out, was that the right person to hire? Was that the right person for the job? Turn it into more of an HR thing. All right, I'm going to go through some of the resources here, and then I'm actually going to take you to them, but it's in the PowerPoint. So first and foremost, you can go to the OSHA website. They do have information on accident investigations, and it connects to their record-keeping standard, which I'd referred to last week, but I'm going to bring up some of the things that I did while I was in grad school and worked at the state. It, associated with that is also workers' compensation documents that need to be filed when there's an accident, and that's through the, the Wisconsin Department of Workforce Development. Unless you're out of Wisconsin, then it would be a different um, agency. And what's, what is really critical with this is that it is a fact-finding exercise. You, the data that's collected from OSHA tends to make its way to, I'm sorry, data collected due to OSHA record-keeping will make its way to the Bureau of Labor Statistics by way of their surveys and their um, their census on fatal occupational injuries. Uh, the statistic that the Bureau of Labor Statistics generates after they collected and surveyed all these injury data are called incidence rates. Out in industry, sure, people call it incident rate. That's not correct. Incidence is a public health term. Uh, and it represents the number of cases per 100, 100 full-time equivalencies, which is so, um, you know, workers typically 40 hours a week. Let's say you have two part-timers working 20 each. They, their equivalency would be the, the one 40-hour week. And here's the equation. I've got the, the reference here. The problem is incidence rates suffer from a lot of limitations. You should not take them at face value. Uh, first and foremost is it in the actual investigation and the recording of it. Uh, there, there is under recording uh, because companies feel that they're gonna look bad if everything gets onto the OSHA log because that's where the original data goes. They also feel that if they re were to report everything, they could possibly get an OSHA inspection. Uh, I, I could totally understand that, though it shouldn't be done that way. So the actual data that gets to the Bureau of Labor Statistics tend to be in, tends to be an underreport or underrepresentation. They fully admit to it. They have a whole section on underreporting. Um, also, an incidence rate takes into account what is recordable and divides it by the number of hours worked. And not every hour worked at a company is risky. So what it does is it, it takes all the hours, both risky and unrisky, and in in the denominator and in the numerator almost all the cases are for the risky and so it's really it's diluting what's really going on and so depending on the division of non-risk versus risk that's you know whether it's going to be more accurate depiction of what's really going on or versus an inaccurate depiction and then also the Bureau of Labor Statistics when they uh, analyze data I was gonna say slice and dice <laughs> The, the reporting of things from like a national perspective, an industry perspective, a state perspective, suffers even more from that diluting that goes on. So really, a company should calculate incidence rates for a job title to compare it within their own company itself. That's the most accurate way to do it. And then tracking it over time is a good way to do it. And it's a lagging indicator. It just should say, oh, you know, over the last several months, this one has spiked above what it normally is. Let's find out why. The Department of Workforce Development, that's our work comp group. Um, you can see the actual state law through, under statute or chapter 102. This here is the maximum wage and rate chart because I thought you'd find this interesting. And it's got the 2000 and 20 to the left and it goes all the way back to um, 2012 so you can see how it's changed over time. This is also called the WKC 9572-P form. So for this year the maximum weekly wage for an injured worker who is losing time is just a little over $1,500. If you make more than that you lose it. If you make less than that it, then it's set at that lower rate. This is maximums. Um, you can kind of see, uh, what I want to call attention to is the death benefit. 
it's actually calculated as four times the annual wage. And if you wanted to calculate the the um, annual or monthly wage, they've got equations to figure that out. It's not perfect, uh, but they do the best they can. And so the maximum death benefit. So what um, what is what is awarded the survivors of someone who dies at work in Wisconsin? Um, it's either four times their annual wage, but up to a maximum of three hundred fifteen thousand dollars. So if you ask what is the price that Wisconsin puts on a human life, somebody who's injured at work, it's about a, it's about three hundred fifteen thousand dollars. That's very, very sad. Worth more than that. Uh, we can actually get Wisconsin-based numbers. Uh, on the left, I've got the uh, information. This is from the Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Health, Wisconsin State Laboratory of Hygiene. It shows that it seems like injuries are kind of going down. Our primary cause or primary three causes are overexertion, slip strips and falls, contact with object, just like we had covered last week um, when it, we were talking about national numbers. I like this one, though, that's in front of us, the five-year trend on total claims and average indemnity cost. Uh, it has been going down, though this only goes to 2016. There, it's very lagging um, due to state funding that it, the actual number has gone down, but you see the average, even though it's come down a little bit, it's not a lot. So the average cost of a claim in 2016 was just under $9,500. And But you can see that in 2012, um, it was $11,000. Um, there's a lot that goes into that. Um, the medical costs have gone up, but I think that indemnification, so the monies that are paid, uh, like on that maximum chart, uh, those seem to have gone down, but medical costs have gone up. If you want additional assistance with doing this stuff, again, I, I will refer back to WorkSafe BC. I referred to them in an earlier lecture. They've got great resources. So if you want to do a more comprehensive fair uh, acts investigation, they've got great resources. If you're looking for examples of more sophisticated accident investigations, the U.S. Chemical Safety Board, they do very complex ones for major disasters. And also they, they provide some really interesting uh, computer-generated videos of how they, how they believe the accident occurred and how they arrived at their findings. You can get more simple stuff from uh, Keller Online Resources. And on the Canvas site, there is a PDF that has the information. It's got the code on the screen. And I'll show you the sign-in sheet. But as a UW-Whitewater student, you have free access to their online materials. And they've got a lot of training and checklists and things like that. So if you're going to, if your company has supervisors or someone on the plant doing the accident investigations, they need specific training on how to do it properly. You don't just give them a checklist and have them run out there and do it because they will just pencil whip it and they won't understand how their own uh, personal biases would likely lean towards blaming the worker. Uh, but what I'd like to do is take you through a, through a few case studies, things that I had worked on uh, as an expert witness. And I want to show you kind of, if we were in a classroom, we'd be doing this exercise together. So I'm going to go through these very quickly. I don't know if you remember the case in which the 35W bridge in Minneapolis collapsed, but I was called in on a case because a city inspector was had, had, had experienced a permanent disability injury uh, while inspecting a gas line hookup. Um, what we were told was the inspector slipped on a oops, sorry, a snow-covered tarp as they were cutting across a storage area and they hit their head on some rebar. And again, they did experience a permanent disability due to a skull fracture. So I was asked to evaluate the case based on uh, depositions and other reports to determine uh, who would be held, what parties are liable for uh, paying for this uh, injured individual's medical and, and permanent in, in indemnity case. So some of the questions I asked is, you know, what is the protocol for people to come on site? What was the city inspector told in coming to do their uh, gas line hookup assessment? Who was with the inspector when they were on site? How are areas of the work site designated? 
Are there any warning signs or any requirements? Uh, was anything done out of the ordinary that may have allowed this to occur? Or, and or, did the inspector do anything out of ordinary um, or that an ordinary person would do that led to the injury? Uh, turns out it was uh, based on a series of um, faulty assumptions by the general contractor. Uh, and it, it, was, it was a unique situation that they were going to hook up to the city's gas line in order to run temp heaters in order to allow for the footings of the bridge to cure. So it was meant to speed up the construction process. So they hadn't anticipated someone who wasn't on site on a regular basis to ever come on. Uh, there was no uh, instruction as far as where the instructor should park, how they should enter the site. Uh, obviously they were able to access it and um, they're able to contact someone to guide them to where they need to do the inspection. In the storage area, there was no protocols for uh, walkways or pathways or, or designation of where not, not to walk. So it really came down to the general contractor um, that they, they brought someone on site without proper uh, notification. In another case, a, uh, a driver of a, of a flatbed truck was delivering railroad ties to a storage area, and it, but it was not owned by that company. And so um, he was invited in. He parked the truck where they asked him to, and they said, go ahead and remove the straps. And so he, was re he removed the straps, and as he was winding them to put them into his um, storage box on his cab, the workers jumped on two different types of fork trucks and started removing stacks of ties. Uh, unfortunately, as the workers were, were moving pretty fast to get the load un, um, removed, uh, one, uh, while well, one of them lifted up uh, one of the loads, it caused the uh, flatbed trailer to become unbalanced and wiggle and that caused a tie to fall off or several of them to fall off and one of them hit the head of the driver who again was finishing rolling things up. The company said the driver should have known better. Um, the driver's like he had no idea. All he, all he knows is that he was working to get the stuff wound up. He knew the guys were working and all of a sudden he was awoken. Um, and his head was bleeding and he was in a lot of pain. Uh, question is, you know, sh does the employer, does their work protocol allow fork truck drivers to, to begin, <coughs> excuse me, the unloading process while anybody else is in the environment? And so should the forklift drivers know the ties fall off? Yeah, because it happened near the back of the, of the flatbed. Did the fork truck drivers know that the driver was still um, in the vicinity? Yes, they did. Uh, had anybody been hit before? No, this was the first time. But I think there was plenty of indication that it could happen. They immediately changed the rule to say, yeah, don't start unloading until the driver has put away their straps and made their way into the office to start filing paperwork. That's all that had to be done. Um, so, the, yeah, the company had to pay for that one. I'm going to skip this last one. It, it was more of the, that was more of the, the worker. You had kind of a, a rogue operator. And I'm going to take you through some of the things here that I, that I had brought up in the lecture. First is OSHA's injury and illness record keeping reporting requirements. Uh, they, you know, because they had changed it just a few years ago. This was brought up in an earlier lecture. Um, but if you ever have questions, it's readily available. The Bureau of Labor Statistics, they have the reports, you know, again, the data collected due to OSHA record keeping, it arrives here and is published. Here is it for, at least in Wisconsin, the, the, the workers' compensation requirements and the forms and the procedures. Uh, if you want the uh, data for Wisconsin, whether it's BLS related or DWD related, it's uh, housed to the Wisconsin State Laboratory of Hygiene. Here's the WorkSafe BC website. Here's the Chemical Safety Board website. Here's the JJ Keller online, and this is where you can put in the information to get your free access.
Now I just want to finish up by just sharing with you some things that I had created when I worked for the state of Wisconsin. The most important was when I started analyzing the um, OSHA recordable data, it was very insufficient and I thought and I felt something needed to be done and so I adopted this Excel form but I expanded out column F because it had three key pieces of the investigation the causation body part and result and when you cram it into one you've got to analyze each one individually I want to analyze the data to figure out what was going on and the other thing I did is I created doubt drop down windows so the people who keep these records there was more standardization of the entries and I put in some other quality checks to make sure they were filling it out properly as they filled out the 300 log, the 300A was automatically filled. And then I had my own third tab to track the severity of things. Um, and so it was always brought up to date. Whenever I copied and pasted or they submitted it, I could look at it. So I could look at it on a monthly basis, quarterly basis. I didn't have to wait till the end of the year or put in much effort. This allowed me to correct things before waiting till the end of the year or to at least reach out and ask questions that I normally wouldn't have until the end of the year, which allowed us to actually improve our numbers because we were thinking about them throughout the year. And management was made aware if things were going up or staying the same, whereas they should have been going down. And so it, um, it really guided the work we were doing and helped us prioritize our efforts where they should be. The other thing I did is I took large sums of data and I combined it to do a comparative study. So here you can see, this is 2002 through 2005, just looking at this, which job title would you focus on? The RCT, look at, it's really high like that. So the first one. So then I focus on the causes. And as you can see, there are four of them that really stand out. Person struck by, restraining person, lifting person, person push pulled. We would have never had this if I didn't create the new form to be filled out. And then we, I looked at just that one job title and the causes, and you can see the severity of the outcomes, whether they're lost time, restricted duty, or no lost time. These are dominated by lost time, restricted time, and the person. So this is the way it looked. So this allowed me to show management what, what's been occurring or what had been occurring, how it, what it looks like over time, and what we really need to do. Then as we implement changes, you know, try to modify the exposure to these. I can show management changes in severity and outcomes. I can show management change in frequency. I can show where, what is happening. And that really helped them. Um, and it also helped them be more confident in investing resources into the areas that were having either the more severe injuries or the more frequent injuries. So um, that's what I did. Uh, that's the important of a proper and balanced accident investigation, but also collecting data and using data to kind of guide and convince management to invest and show commitment to the safety program.